Chapter 231, Thrice Denied Serana's POV a bit earlier. How reckless can you possibly be? I shout internally as I see Raven charge through the ranks of lesser vampires, followed by the silent warrior priest. I had observed him go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Gregorius, a vampire elder well into his second millennium, but simply charging in like this was completely foolish even then. Or was he not kidding when he quoted his seer bullshit when he first found me? Overthinking it is useless. I shake my head and decide to step after him. Or at least I try to, as the moment I step across the ruined home's threshold, the all-encompassing presence of Molag Bal slams into me from seemingly every direction, both possible and impossible. All of the flimsy self-assurance I had managed to gather on my way here disappears like so much dust in the wind as old fears rear their ugly heads and my legs refuse to budge. Like a deer before a hunter, I stand there staring helplessly as the Breton knights cut down thrall after thrall. Their onslaught only slowed when they came to stand against one of the lesser vampires with whom they were evenly matched. My jumbled thoughts cease for but a moment as I see Raven and the priest finally break through and enter the tunnel network, no doubt leading them to their insane goal. I know that I must go after them. What awaits down there is not something they will be able to defeat on their own, but the mere thought of defying the one holding the strings upon my soul makes me want to curl up in a corner and forget that anything was happening. Yet from within another part of me snarls, move. But, but, do not think, move. It repeats, God's damn, move. And so I do. Entering a state of detachment, I no longer even notice Bal's presence as I slink around the bloody melee. None are able to notice me as shadows seek to hide me almost of their own volition. Nothing matters as I descend, not the winding tunnels, nor the idolatry and edifices of belight cultists and most assuredly not the pitiful fear I felt moments earlier. I only had to think about making one footstep in front of the other. Almost without noticing, I had already sneaked into the main shrine of this hidden temple, the gaze of my hated patron too focused on the mortal who dared mock him so openly to even notice my presence. The moment I stop moving, however, whatever inner strength I had mustered earlier disappears as if it was never there allowing me to truly bask in the terror that was Molag Bal for the first time in millennia. Once again, I am left motionless as I am forced to watch in excruciating detail as the now-burning Gregorius eviscerates the armoured priest as if he was completely naked and proceeds to rip out his heart, immediately throwing it upon the altar and completely ignoring the blasts of solar magic working to end his existence. The moment the heart touched the altar, I felt the malicious presence of Molag Bal swell as he forced far more power than he was permitted onto the world, bypassing the wards holding him in check and using the opportunity to charge his mace for his current champion's use. Time seemed to slow down as I watched the now-empowered Gregorius prepare to strike Raven down and deliver him to Molag's vile ministrations, only for the damned elf to completely ignore him and instead unsummon his mask and turn toward me, staring dead into my eyes, his challenging smirk from earlier appearing once again. Feeling brave yet, my inner self asked with a familiar inflection, damn it all, I can barely think much less fight. So you are just going to stand there, like a bawling child? Almost as if he heard my inner monologue, Raven's smirk widens slightly his eyes almost aglow with challenge and mockery. Are you going to let him mock you? Mock us, I hiss. I don't know what to do. Gregorius is already moving. Come on, Serana, you can do this. You only need to defy a god. Easy, right? Your friend is going to die. I am trying, damn you. Move, girl. All right then, lean in, extend claws and rip his rotten heart out. In the blink of an eye, I feel myself lunge across the room, and in the next instant, I find myself standing above a very dead Gregorius, his heart slowly dissolving in my hand. What in oblivion just happened? At a girl! Well, well, well. The far too amused voice of Raven draws me from my inner ravings. Looks like someone found their guts. Feeling less restrained than usual, I go to respond with near equal snark but then the duo of invisible eyes staring right into my soul reminds me that we were not quite alone as Molag Bal outright shrieks, You filthy little traitor! I am brought to my knees in an instant, 
as I feel something clawing at my very essence. My needless breathing turns erratic as I remember the previous time I was forced under those eyes. This time, however, I was truly about to die as I felt Molag Bal begin trying to rip my very soul from my body. Grasping at straws, I desperately looked up to Raven and would have probably been stunned if not for the mind-shattering pain I was in as I saw him standing there, still with the same confidence he showed earlier, his blade glowing with near-blinding light pointed right in front of me, just within my reach. Raven's POV, completely ignoring Molag's roaring threats and promises of non-consensual coitus, I stare right into Sarana's pained and confused eyes, my slightly challenging smirk still plastered onto my face as I offered forth her salvation, and incidentally ensured my slight against the rapist fuck was never going to be forgotten. I do not know what went on inside of her mind as she stared at the sword, but to my great surprise, whatever it was, it lasted only a couple of seconds before she grabbed it with such force she nearly twitched her finger a bit too far and cut herself. Even the Daedra turned silent as she grabbed the blade, a quiet moment passing between us as I charged the blade and directed all of its power toward the bond between her and her forceful patron. What? What are you doing? Molag's voice suddenly turned from threatening to cautious. Hmm? I looked up at the shrine while still keeping most of my attention on Sarana. Oh, you know, just being petty. What are you? doing? the Daedra asks seethingly. I tilt my head momentarily and then my smirk turns into a face-splitting grin as I wink at the carved face on the shrine, the spite. Just then whatever was happening to Serana seemed to click and a cacophonous metaphysical snap resounded all around us. Cracks spread across the tunnel walls and the entire thing threatened to collapse in on itself if not for the rather large ward scheme surrounding it all. The now freed, yet still very much vampiric, Serana looked at her hands with an expression of surprise, slowly blinked, and fell unconscious on the spot. I was nice enough to levitate her into a comfortable corner when she did. A few silent moments pass as I feel Molag's glare, and his voice returns, this time firm instead of angry. You will pay for that. Not if I kill you first. I respond without hesitation and start walking toward the mace on the ground. Fool, the Daedra scoffs, you cannot kill an immortal. Maybe, I shrug and grab the mace, immediately suppressing its attempts at subverting me, but I can damn well try. Your arrogance will be your end, he says with deceptively calm certainty. It will. I nod, accepting the fact, but you will not be there to see it. I circle around the shrine, the ward around it already showing degradation as the faith and patronage that powered it had started disappearing with Logrolf's death. Then an idea strikes me. The Staff of Magnus appears in my hands and I start channeling a massively more complex set of runes into a ward which would surround and power the current one. As I do so, I mutter, Prince Mephala, would you kindly grace me with your presence? It takes her less than a second to answer. My oh my, I thought you would not remember me, my dear. I feel two slender hands embrace me from behind as a voice purrs into my ear, and there at the foot of the shrine stood a horned silhouette glaring at the both of us. Wench! He grits out. How uncouth! Mephala titters. Are you always so unpleasant to your guests? The silhouette's burning eyes narrow as he once more grits out. Why? Why what? Mafala tilts her head innocently, but before the increasingly frustrated Molag can respond, she continues, Why ask my chosen to desecrate your shrine and your artifact? I can hear him grit his imaginary teeth so hard they sound like they are about to break. Yes, he finally forces out. Remember those servants mine you forced your filthy self on to the point of shattering their minds some thirty years ago? Mafala asks cheerfully, but her aura is anything but. Molag stares at her for an astonished moment before exploding, you would start a war over something so petty. The fact that you do not consider the war already started says enough. Mafala tuts at him as if he were a child, and then pats my shoulder. Now, Raven, why don't we show this bastard what happens when someone challenges us? I roll my eyes at her wording, but still point my staff at the shrine. Indeed, let's. A massive pulse of magical and daedric energies smashes into the silhouette of Molag Baal, the final words of I will D, not even getting to be heard, 
as his presence was banished and the shrine now fully overtaken by that of the webweaver. Paying the disgusting shrine no further attention, I turned to my giddy patron, her entire presence radiating smug satisfaction with an undertone of genuine catharsis at the successful vengeance of her subordinates. Wordlessly, I offer her the mace, and she picks the unwieldy hunk of metal with complete ease. On the magical side of things, I could acutely feel the moment the artifact passed from Nern into oblivion and then into the spiral skine. Mephala tosses it to the side, and it disappears into motes of light as she focuses on me fully. Once again, you surpass all of my expectations. She purrs while visibly stopping herself from jumping me and instead settling for patting my shoulder. Expect your reward in a bit. She whispers into my ear, her voice unnecessarily husky. Suppressing a shiver, I tilt my head, away from her of course, and ask, was the deal not the ebony blade for the mace? She giggles lightly, oh, it will be as much a reward for me as it is to you. Bye now. I do not have a good feeling about that. I lightly shudder and then shake my head, heading toward the exit and slinging Serana over my shoulder as I did so. The others waiting upstairs were expectedly curious about what happened, and it took me close to an hour to answer all of their questions, as Calselmo begrudgingly helped me bury the entire tunnel system with terramancy. I gave them an edited story about the priest sacrificing himself to forevermore bar Molag's influence from this ancient city, and no doubt created something of a legend about old Logrolf. I was not certain if Boethia would appreciate the irony. Finally, I managed to get the knights to go and report to the Jarl, as I made the excuse of having to bring Serana somewhere to rest. Though in truth, I just wanted to have some rest myself, after the exhausting fight I just had. As I approached the residence provided to me and mine by the Jarl, I heard a slight commotion coming from inside, and after a glance grew both worried and curious. Soon I stepped into the dining room of the small mansion and was met with a rather daunting sight. All of the myrrh I sent after the Namirans did manage to return, but each carried a haunted look, and even as they were surrounded in a feast's worth of food, none deigned to touch their meal. With sluggish hesitance, all eyes turned to me, and I had to signal for my guards and Alor to remain seated, as even in their current state they attempted to raise and salute me. My retainers looked just a small bit better, as they were only tired instead of outright traumatized. Both of them simply gave me looks of heatless anger and returned to grumbling something to each other. One quick trip to a nearby room and one tucked out vampire, later I sat next to Davos and offered him and Nightshade a cigar each, something they took eagerly. So Davos, what happened? I ask, as the silence grows too tense to bother tolerating. His dead eyes did not pro- Chapter 232, Fleshcrafter's Demise. General POV. Where to even begin? Raven's right-hand man runs his hand through his hair tiredly. How about at the beginning? Raven snarks immediately. Completely unsurprised by the response, Davos deadpans, right, and begins his story. So there we were having a relaxed game of chess, when just a bit after you left with Serana, one of the agents informed me that the cultists were leaving the city. All at once, or... Raven interjects. All at once. Davos scoffs. They weren't suspected to begin with, so the extra caution was unneeded. Right. His boss nods. Nothing too suspicious on the surface level. In any case, Davos returns to the point. We left just a moment after you yourself went to investigate the haunted house. Davos's POV. A light, barely audible thud informs me that I had a guest. One cautious glance informed me of the rest. Snake, I nod in greeting, your report. Targets are leaving the city as a group. So far, no one has raised any eyebrows, as it is probably a common occurrence. Tough one of them was leading a rather unfocused priest of R.K. with him. They are heading southeast, probably toward an old ruin, or maybe even a tomb. The thin elf reports dutifully. Can't have their filthy temple out in the open. I grumble with some frustration, then again, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if they did. Indeed, Snake chuckles. The Lord would probably set it on fire just because he could. It is a bit more complex than that, but he doesn't need to know that. Instead of elaborating, I merely get up from my chair and wave him into following me. If they are already moving out, then we should do so as well. 
losing track just because we were too slow would be embarrassing. I do hope that we aren't about to enter another charnel house, General POV. And was it? Raven asks while shooting glances at his distraught guards. I will get to that later. Davos pointlessly attempts to delay reliving the situation. How about you let me finish retelling the pursuit first? Raven nods, his face serious for once and lacking any of his usual joviality. Go ahead. Davos's POV. So, Lord Davos, what can you tell me about this Namira? The ever-knowledge-hungry Falmer kid asks with genuine curiosity. Just Davos is fine, kid. I am a gutter rat, just like most of us in Skyrim. I wave him off and hear some not approving but relatable mumbling from the myrrh at arms, though for whatever reason Nightshade shoots me an annoyed look. Yeah, I am not dealing with that right now. Instead I focus back on the question, as for Namira and her lot, think cannibals, fleshcraft, rot, decay, all things bad about the mortal body. My voice grows less lively with each adjective I add to my description. You face them yourself then. The kid, bless his innocent heart, completely fails to notice my distress over it. What is the best way to fight them? Maybe not as innocent then. I snort quietly, stay at range or ambush them. They either have enhanced strength or are a member of a witch coven, and even though I don't believe we will be dealing with witches here, I'd still recommend being careful. And what if they are neither? Arlor asks. Then just kill them as if they are neither kid. I chuckle. It isn't Dwemercraft. Oh. The kid hisses slightly before trying to uselessly bury his burning face in his journal. Sir, the other agent that left the city with us, Slaughterfish, I believe, returns from his tracking assignment and salutes. Receiving a quick nod from me, he speaks again. The suspected cultists have left the main road and are currently manoeuvring through a series of goat paths further to the south. Of course it wasn't going to be that simple. I sigh and turn to the rest. Better make sure your boots are on right. We don't want to be slipping where we are going. General POV. Goat paths, eh? Raven chuckles. Told you you should have learned levitation. What, so I can die the moment I ran out of magicka? Davos scoffs. Not all of us are literal fonts of magic like yourself. Only I can be me after all. Raven nods to himself faux pompously, pretending to caress a long beard while doing so and earning himself another deadpan from Davos. I trust that the goat paths were not that big of an issue. They were annoying, but we managed. Davos waves the whole situation off as unimportant, much to the visible relief of a duo of guards. What we found at the other end was far less encouraging, however. Davos's POV. That is downright creepy. One of the greener myrrh mutters loudly, earning agreeing nods from most of the others. Before us stood a literal passage mage out of large bones. We were not yet cursed with the sight of rotting flesh, but with this disgusting thing it was only a matter of time. Well then, might as well go in. I force down all of my fears and arm my repeating crossbow. Loud or quiet? Snake asks while twirling his poison dagger. I quirk an eyebrow at him. You want to sneak into that without any support. One fearful blanch later, I mutter, thought so. Formation? One of the more senior guards asks. Armor in front, agents to the sides, mages to the back. I list off, keep it simple and watch each other's backs, and for the love of Azura, do not under any circumstance split up. I stare at each and every one of the newer guards just to make sure they understood that last part. The guards took their time reluctantly forming up at the entrance, and it did not take me long to realize what the problem was. Instead of trying to force a bunch of fresh myrrh, even if well-trained, into the darkness, I turned to Nightshade. Think you can conjure us up some kind of vanguard? It takes her only a split second to see what I was getting at, and only a bit over that, for her to wordlessly take a stance and start channeling more magicka than I have in total into a single spell. One big ass white runic circle later, and a large ice atronach was towering over all of us. Thanks, I mutter, somewhat awkwardly due to her silence. A light smirk spreads on her face. You are welcome. I resist the urge to throw my hands up in frustration and focus back on the task. Well then, what are we waiting for? I ask, only barely holding back my sarcasm, into the depths of oblivion. General POV 
I am guessing that you came to regret those words. Raven immediately comments. Davos groans, you have no bloody idea. Many of the elves present outright flinch at the mention of blood, earning themselves a curious look from Raven. Davos took a deep breath. The first few chambers were almost suspiciously empty, to the point we expected to only find the cultists themselves. You found anything but, no? His lord's gaze grew somewhat dark. Davos took a long gulp of ale before visibly holding himself back from spitting onto the floor. Fuck did I miss your pyromania when we stepped into the third chamber. Davos's POV. The first thing I noticed as we passed the smashed stone doorway, the Atronach left behind, was the smell, the signature sickly sweet tinge of rotting flesh made it very obvious what awaited us inside. Or at least I thought so. By the gods. One of the soldiers gasped. Another spent a couple of seconds staring at whatever they saw before moving to the side and vomiting violently and giving me a perfect sight of what was beyond. Massive, almost artistically arranged edifices of carved flesh filled the whole chamber, the path to the next one being entirely covered with neatly carved skin spread into the mockery of a carpet, while multiple heads, the sizes of which I would rather not remember, stared at us from each direction, one of them even seemingly blinking at me, but that must have been a trick of my mind. What sick joke is this? One of the older soldiers hissed. Something worth destroying. I voice, a bit more hoarsely than I intended, this place is even worse than Hag's End. Steal yourselves, men. We are here to purge the bastards who did this. This seems to at least mollify the warriors, even if half of them looked just about ready to bolt, they were disciplined enough to fall into line when the command was given. I looked to the mages. Are the two of you prepared to go, oh, oh, only to see Nightshade desperately trying to make Alor breathe as he seemed to have somehow become paler than physically possible, even for a Falmer. Nightshade gives me a slightly panicked look. Not that she was shaken by the scene she was too old for that, but seemingly in fear of the kid literally knocking himself out with how erratically he was breathing. Thinking quickly, I step over to them and grab him by the shoulders, shaking him lightly. Kid, look at me. His breathing continues refusing to calm, but at least his eyes were planted firmly onto my own. Good, you can hear me. I nod encouragingly. Now do as I do. Breathe in. And out. I repeat the process dozens of times until his breathing finally calms down and he seems to no longer be under risk of panicking. Good job, kid. I pat him on the shoulder and he nods numbly. Now I want you to focus on the backs of either me or Nightshade and just keep on walking. Can you do that for me? He nods a bit more quickly. Excellent. I force a smile and leave him to Nightshade. Come on, men. Let us butcher these fuckers, I say and step in front of the formation. What did I ever do to deserve having to do this shit? General POV. Raven sends a quick glance to Aelor, who looked to be doing somewhat fine, or at least far better than the story would imply, so he chooses to leave checking on him for after the tale. Instead, he focuses back on Davos. Something tells me that the room was not simply a fleshcrafter's workshop. Davos scoffs. Of bloody course it wasn't. Davos POV. Step after careful step, we crossed the living crime against all that was good and holy, the disgusting squelching some of our steps produced only adding to the disturbing nature of the situation. Naturally, everything had to go the way of Dagon. The moment we crossed a good two-thirds of the room, as the mass of flesh suddenly roiled violently, fleshy abominations rising from within and skittering or lumbering toward us with focused aggression. Forward, I yell out immediately, knowing that these kinds of situations were best faced through a choke point. Everyone started running, even Aelor, though he looked close to falling over on multiple occasions. One of the guards slipped, but a guildsman stepped out from nearby and helped him up to his feet before running forward himself. I share a glance with Nightshade and she nods, sending her Atronach to hold the abominations back as we cross the final stretch the guards forming a wall of halberds the moment all eleven of us were inside. Though the sight that greeted us as the Atronach was finally overrun and forced to detonate chilled our bones. The mass of flesh was far larger than I originally imagined, and most of it had mobilized by this point. I knew in an instant that we would never survive facing that without some heavy magical support, and Boss was no doubt half a hold away by now. Shit, I mutter bitterly and prepare my crossbow. 
Wall of flames now, Nightshade commands suddenly, and the well-trained soldiers of Dagoth all point one of their hands toward the entrance, casting a flame spell as one. A moment later, I too joined in the group spell. She probably had a way out, and I sure as shit didn't, so I might as well see what she was going to do. As soon as she got some cover, Nightshade knelt onto the thankfully fleshless floor of the passage and started channeling a brown-tinted spell, the stone in front of her slowly rising into a thick wall. A couple of the fleshy creatures screeched in pain, but most backed off. Whatever basic intelligence they possessed, no doubt told them that we would run out of fire sooner or later. And so we did. One by one the soldier's flames sputtered out soon followed by my own, and Nightshade was nowhere near done with her own casting. One of the creatures vaults over the short stone wall, half blocking the passage, and just as we prepare ourselves for a disadvantaged grind against the undead abominations, a near-blinding light sears our eyes as a bolt of sunlight smashes into the disgusting fleshy spider thing and disintegrates it on the spot. In steps Alor, his left hand blazing with gold magic, and his right holding a simple silver spear glowing with easily recognisable runecraft. With a snarl that I never expected to hear from the kid, he starts barraging the creatures outside, doing actual damage with solar explosion after solar explosion, killing a good fifth of them before the wall became too tall for him to aim properly and was then sealed. Just before the other side was fully gone, the kid yelled, And stay there, you filthy abominations! There were a couple of meaty thuds form the other side, but the wall thankfully held at which point Nightshade allowed herself to collapse into a sweat-ridden mess, though before anyone could offer her any help, she forced herself back up and grunted out a, let's go on, I want out of here as swiftly as possible. I look to the rest and smile weakly. Well, boys, you heard the lady. As we started marching once again, I clapped Aylor on the shoulder, the way the kid straightened up in pride would have probably made me burst out in laughter if I didn't feel like ripping off someone's head at the time. General POV. Most interesting. Raven hummed, I am glad you made use of that spear, Alor. And I am glad you gave it to me. Alor tries to make his response sound like a joke, but it just ends up sounding strained. Shaking his head, Raven looks back to Davos, I am guessing that the blood and gore got only worse as you went in. That is the weird thing, Davos half shrugs. Things got cleaner and cleaner as we went deeper, to the point of me thinking that only some of them did the weird fleshcraft thing. And much like these things usually go, the moment you stepped into the final chamber, things got unfathomably worse, Raven asks expectantly. Nope, Davos retorts immediately. After a bout of staring, Raven palms his face. What exactly do you mean by nope? Exactly that, nope. Davos smirks slightly at finally managing to annoy his boss, but knows better than to push further. They were all pathetically weak. I was honestly going to believe that the flesh monster was unrelated, if not for the leader literally screaming at me to the contrary. Somewhat confused, Raven simply waves him on. Might as well just tell me the rest. Davos's POV. Growing more and more concerned by the lack of monsters, or even Draga, we stepped further and further into the ruin. A couple of trinkets were found, and I had no qualms about letting the men grab them after Nightshade checked them for curses and the like. We all needed something to push us forward after what we saw. Finally, we approached a stone doorway engraved with Namiran markings, the sound of guttural chanting coming from the other side. Prepare yourselves. I half mutter, half bark. Our targets are near. The door was soon confirmed to be unlocked and untrapped, and as one we barged inside, expecting to be met with nightmarish monsters only to see a bunch of city folk chanting while gleefully staring at a bound priest. I did not even blink before I pointed my crossbow at the lead cultist's hand which held a sacrificial dagger and pulled the trigger, disintegrating the bitch's hand in an instant. All of the cultists snapped their eyes into our direction and they grew fearful at the sight of us. You? The leader points her remaining trembling hand at me. Who are you? How did you get past the wall? The wall? Apt, I guess. I allow myself a smirk as I realize that these were just basic men and elves using their pitiable daedric powers to commit mindless cruelty onto their fellows. As my men take their aim and prepare to charge, I loudly clear my throat. By the order of court mage Raven Dagoth, 
all of you are sentenced to summary execution for malicious Daedra worship and the murder of countless innocents. May your filthy patron have mercy on your souls, for we shall not. And then... General POV. Nice speech, by the way. Raven nods approvingly. Davos rolls his eyes. I spend way too much time near a certain someone. Hey, presentation is important, Raven retorts petulantly, but quickly settles himself. That does not explain one thing, however. Somewhat fearfully, Davos asks, And what is that? Even with seeing the fleshy abomination and fighting the cultists, all of you look way too worn out. He explains with narrowing eyes, That is without mentioning that you took nearly two extra days to come back. Davos looks away while everyone else glares at him and Nightshade. What did you do? Raven asks. Weeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
while Nightshade nods wordlessly. In any case, I am off to see the Jarl. I say, slowly getting up, make sure that the rest are not about to make a mess and send someone to inform me the moment Serana wakes up. Sure thing, boss. The halls of Understone Keep were inured with a heavy sense of tension as I stepped inside. Many eyes immediately fell upon me as I passed, but then swiftly returned to their duties. Absently, I noted that a good third of the guards were not wearing their usual armour and instead looked to be more in line with the housecarls of the landed thanes of the city. Even a pair of ever more squires could be seen patrolling the halls, replacing the corrupt ones already. Either he is a fool or is baiting the silverbloods. I certainly hope it is the latter. My thoughts are interrupted as I stop walking and look to the right, just as Calselmo hobbles out of his little museum. The moment his eyes land on me, his hurry's expression shifts into a glare of not quite hatred. It was cutting it close, however. Master Calselmo, I greet politely, pretending not to notice his expression. Master Raven, he grits out, would you kindly follow me to my study? I have things we need to discuss. I raise an eyebrow at this, though I was pretty certain what he wanted. Truly, I ask with faux eagerness, lead the way then. We pass by the many guards without saying anything else. Whatever was simmering within the old Ultma was definitely not something he wanted overheard. Or maybe he was just being polite about it. Finally, we stepped into his little Dwemer workshop, Chuck Excavation Center, and after he made sure his nephew wasn't about to blow something up, he led me toward a carved-out room, housing a small library and many scattered Dwemer parts. Definitely alteration made. I note, noticing the two smooth walls. Caltelmo takes a seat at his table and offers me one as well. After being seated and waiting politely for the elder to gather his thoughts, I speak up. Well then, what did you wish to discuss? He pours himself some kind of shimmering wine, no doubt made through dubious alchemy, and takes a short swig. You noted the sudden influx of new guards, yes? I did indeed, and I have to say I am still on the fence between being impressed or disappointed. I nod, taking the cup he offered me. The wine was surprisingly good and even had a bit of fizziness which brought back memories. So you do know something? Calselmo narrows his eyes. I wondered why the Jarl sent guards from many different units to help me guard the damned shrine, but to think he sent them there to be culled. Pretty smart of him if he can pull off the aftermath. I hum approvingly while twirling the shiny wine cup. Bah, Calselmo huffs, his accent turned almost comically Nordic before he composed himself. The boy styles himself a wise strategist. A complete delusion, no doubt, but he can have his moments. Shame about the couple of loyal ones he had me bring. Yet something tells me you are unhappy with him, I say leadingly. Of course I am. The old elf puts down his cup a bit too loudly. The boy realized what you were doing and didn't think to warn me. I let his words settle for a moment before deadpanning at him so hard I swear I could see a minute flinch. You didn't even consult him, did you? He tries to look confident, but after my trademarked long stare of disappointment, he looks away and huffs. He hadn't needed me for over a decade, and I am too focused on my own research. We generally don't even talk with each other. And this is where I cut you off and tell you to deal with your own interpersonal issues on your own time. I say without even a tiny bit of hesitation, what do you want me to do here? He seems slightly irritated but doesn't press. Instead, his earlier glare returns as he points at me. You sent me against a bunch of vampires. And? I fold my arms while tapping a finger on one of them for the sake of looking impatient. I am an old man. I am not supposed to be fighting a Daedra's rabid dogs he hisses. My eyes narrow, you are also the court wizard of Markarth, and if you did your damn job properly, you would have never had to fight them in the first place. Not all of us are as insane as you madmen from Winterhold, he snaps, though his voice remains low. We have lives beyond simply showing off our magical might just so that we can feel proud of ourselves. I see. I tap my finger a couple more times before exhaling and unfolding my arms, your cowardice aside. I begin, and his eye twitches. I will admit that my standards of what a true mage should be may be a bit high. So, Calselmo, what is it that you want? My voice hardens. He must have seen something in my eyes and immediately looks away, probably rethinking his original demand, and after a bit speaks. 
There is a giant spider blocking any further excavation efforts of Nchuan Zell. I want it gone. Just that, I ask, genuinely stunned, but how little he decided to ask. He must be really rattled with how little of a shit I gave. Calselmo scoffs. I assure you it is not so simple. The damn thing is massive and still as fast and agile as the rest of its kin. The blasted cowards who I sent to deal with it even gave it a bloody name. Oh, I raise an eyebrow. Indeed, damnable spider goes by Nimhi now. He drawls, now I trust you will prepare a proper hunting pa. He suddenly turns completely silent as he feels a shimmer of power covering a vast portion of the excavation. Still staring Calselmo dead in the eyes, I spread my senses through the cave system, my metaphysical eye swiftly landing on a truly giant specimen of frostbite spider. It only took me a tiny mental nudge to have the massive beast scurrying toward a hidden cave outside of the city. Done? I declare suddenly. Calselmo blinks slowly, and upon realizing that I was not in fact fucking with him, loses even the tiniest hint of his earlier haughtiness. Truly he rasps. Indeed. I nod, treating the whole thing as unimportant. I trust that was everything. Yes. He nods hesitantly. Excellent. I clap my hands and get up from my seat. It was truly a pleasure working with you, Master Calselmo. He stares at me with disbelief before letting out a heavy sigh and forcing out a likewise. Thought you could extort me, you old fart. Ha. Huh. The Jarl ushered me toward his own private study the moment I stepped into his throne room. The man looked outright giddy at finally getting back at his uppity vassals, and the large number of nobles sitting around in the throne room were also visibly eager for the no doubt massive pie that was about to be made from the flesh of the Silverbloods. And I immediately regret making that comparison, considering what was crawling through these halls. Not so long ago, I really should not be making such metaphors. A reason to celebrate, Jarl Igmund? I ask as the man practically skips through the palace. Why would I not celebrate? He smiles, genuinely happy. I am finally about to be rid of those upstarts. Only to replace them with others, no doubt. I quip and his countenance dims only slightly. Bah! He waves me off. They will know to be thankful for a while at least. Enough for me to secure my position against any other silver blood wannabes. Prudent, I voice neutrally, but better to deal with our resident upstarts before celebrating. In that you are completely right. Igmund agrees easily. Your agent has been invaluable and gave me so much dirt on the entire clan that I could bury them alive in it. Yet you wish to be truly rid of them, I note. I do. He nods eagerly. I want all the leaders dead at my feet and the rest banished from the city in shame. I hum for a while before shrugging. As long as you do not wholesale slaughter them, I believe that that is acceptable. I won't turn them into martyrs by killing children. His eyes darken. I know why you would say that, but it still doesn't sit well that you felt the need to. Nobles will always be nobles, no matter their kin or creed. I shrug carelessly. I guess you are right in that. He sighs. Now then, I have some ideas on how to deal with the bastards, but your input will no doubt be helpful. I offer him a slight inclination of my head. I am at your service. Hours later, with the sun already setting once more, I made my way back to my residence. Throughout our long conversation, I learned that Igmund really could call himself something of a strategist, even though Calselmo was right in the sense that he wasn't quite that good. In the end, we settled with a plan, and all it would take was a couple of days to spread false news and rumours to bait the silver bloods into openly revealing their hand the nobles and even the Breton knighthood would waste no time in ripping them to shreds once that happened. I just hope that any Stormcloak supporters in the city weren't stupid enough to try and commit suicide by way of angry Igmund once the commotion started. With quiet steps, I made my way toward my room and lit a bright candle atop one of the smaller tables in the corner, a large canvas spread out on a wooden board appearing in my hands, followed by a brush. But a moment later... Hours more passed as I immersed myself into painting the landscape I sketched during my journey to Markarth, my highly enhanced memory easily allowing me to keep an almost perfect mental image of it in my mind as I did my work. I was so immersed with my work, in fact, that I barely heard the creaking of the door once someone quietly entered, 
it did not take me long to realize who it was. A fine evening for a midnight stroll, no? I ask as I get up and dismiss my painting equipment. The very distraught visage of Serana shifts slightly, though I fail to decipher why, and she nods quickly, already turning toward the exit as she did. Time to see just how far the power of the sword goes. Chapter 234 Of Friendship and Intrigue Serana remains quiet as I lead us out of the palace compound and up one of the walkways leading into the wealthy upper parts of the city, carved into the side of the mountain. Only after a good five minutes, at which point we had already reached a stone balcony overlooking the city walls, did she finally appear ready to talk. Feeling all right, I ask patiently, my eyes planted firmly onto the vista of Markarth's hold. I... She struggles with her answer. I do not know. Take your time. We are in no rush. I offer patiently, still enjoying the view, and she does indeed take her time, joining me in my staring into the distance and gathering her thoughts, nervously gripping the stone fence with her slightly twitching hands from time to time. Finally, after a very long while of simply enjoying the silence, she suddenly takes a deep breath and begins to speak. I feel as if something has been ripped out of me that I will never get back. I give her an appraising look and stealthily scan her with my magic. After failing to notice anything detrimental, I finally speak, I do hope you are not suddenly feeling unwell. Her expression turns wry at my words, likely at having pieced together what I have just done. Before she shakes her head slightly, nothing of that sort, I just feel the lack of a presence that has been with me ever since. Your transformation. I offer diplomatically, and she nods with some relief. Hmm. I cup my chin thoughtfully. I did not think that the Daedrabound feel their patron's presence so acutely. Not all of us, no. She shakes her head. I have just been bound to him for so long that I feel lost without the constant oppressive presence in my mind. Now everything seems so silent. She winces as she says the last word. To pry or not to pry? Hmm. I think not. I ignore my stray thoughts and instead ask, Would you mind describing exactly how you feel? I might be able to help. She gives me an odd look. I did not know there was magic that could fix something like this. I stare at her for a silent moment before letting out a snort and bursting into a fit of quiet laughter, earning myself an offended stare in return. Oh, by Dagoth, no. I chuckle a final time and raise a placating hand. You do realize that these problems are usually far easier to deal with by, you know, talking about them. She blinks slowly before looking away in shame. I did not. Oof. I mutter silently before forcing my cheery exterior to the fore once again. Come on then, tell me how you feel. She takes a moment to compose herself and begins, Everything feels lighter, like a weight I did not know was there has been lifted from my shoulders, yet all of my powers save for the more extreme forms of vampiric domination are still with me. I guess the best way to describe what I feel is I am more alive than I have been for thousands of years, yet it all feels so... wrong? Ignoring the immense urge to question just how she knows which types of vampiric charm she still has, I tilt my head, and what is the issue then? Your very soul has been liberated from your tormentor, it was obviously not going to happen without consequences, but most of those are just things you can deal with in time. Time. She practically spits the word out. Time is the exact issue here. I have spent so much time under his thrall that I feel completely lost as to what to do now. The very idea of moving on feels foreign to me. Then simply do not think about it and do it. I shrug, earning an exasperated look from the vampire. Simply keep moving forward and you will one day find your balance and desire for a future. Besides, it isn't like you are going to be going at it alone. I am not, she asks with genuine confusion. Of course not. I scoff. I don't plan on dying any time soon and I have no doubt you will make many more connections who will help you every step of the way. After all, isn't that what friends are for? For a moment, she looks like a deer stuck in headlights, her thoughts, instincts, and experiences battling against each other briefly before her mouth twitches upward slightly in the closest thing she can manage to a genuine smile. Yes, friends sounds nice.
and at that exact moment, almost as if Akatosh or Oriel, as that would fit far better in this situation, wanted to fuck with us, the sun crested above the distant mountain tops, covering the city in a wave of pleasant gold. Unfortunately, I did not quite have the luxury of enjoying the sunrise as I quickly turned to Sarana, fully expecting her to demand that we leave only to find her staring directly into the rising sun with a small tear running down her cheek. I... She choked slightly. I do not feel rejected by it. Dear fucking Dagoth, blasphemy is broken. You only notice that now? Scorch radiates smugness from his little pond of magicka. Ignoring the stupid bird, I tap the vampire on her shoulder supportively. That is great. But she ignores me completely, her thoughts still completely consumed by the distant ball of fire and magic. Realizing that she wasn't about to snap out of it, and unwilling to do it for her, I settled on watching the sunrise myself. It was after all a beautiful view indeed. To say that Sarana was embarrassed when she finally did snap out of it would be an understatement. Even with that, however, the overwhelming happiness she felt at being able to walk around without being judged by existence itself easily surpassed any form of embarrassment, and she spent most of the remaining day basking in the fact that she could take a pleasant stroll. We settled into a peaceful rhythm in the following days, as things were being prepared in the background, me and my people simply kicked back and enjoyed the city like a bunch of lackadaisical tourists, drawing many curious looks but no complaints as we were spending a fair bit of money wherever we went. It was only five days later that I was summoned by Igmund. Things were about to kick off and I could simply kick back and enjoy the proverbial fireworks. General POV Hundreds of underfed Bretons clad in rags and furs and wielding improvised weaponry stood before a large, recently unbarred Dwemer gate, the leader of whom stood at the back, talking with a tall, noble-looking Nord man, dressed in much the same manner. I thank you for all your help, Rath. My people will not forget you when the time comes. The elderly Madanak offers the Nord man a grateful nod, the closest thing to a bow as he was still considered king and kings do not bow. Think nothing of it, my friend. The stocky, dark-haired Nord noble offers a sincere-looking smile in return. I'd do anything to get back at those traitorous bastards that had me locked up in here, and you have been good to me. Of course, friend. Madanak affirms, before picking out a key from his pouch and offering it to the Nord, here, there is a secret door next to my bed that will lead you out of the city. I wouldn't want you to be implied with our escape. The Nord blinks in surprise, though not for a reason Madanak would think, and takes the key wordlessly. Only for the forsworn king to grab a bundle of fur clothing and also shove it into the Nord's hands. And take this as well, it is blessed with the old magics, something to remember me by. Wrath blinks and nods offering one final warrior's handshake to the Forsworn before turning around and at first walking, then outright rushing toward the secret passage he had long since found out about and already learned how to open. As he stepped into the stone passage, he threw the fur rags onto the ground in sheer disgust at having been touched by the vile magic of the Reachmen. Then he quickly picked it up the moment he remembered why he was there in the first place. He wasn't about to let his family's thanehood fall because of his father's debts. At the other end of the gate, a large commotion was threatening to draw all eyes to the entrance of the feared Sidna mine as all the forces, including the corrupt guards they bought out, of the Silverblood family scrambled together due to a tip they had received from one of their informants from the palace. Thonar Silverblood, the de facto leader of the family, did feel suspicious when one of his men managed to overhear one of the royal court mage's men talking about a potential breakout from the mine, but even with his suspicions, he had to take action before the Jarl realized just what was going on. If they failed to cut the force worn down in time, they would all be killed to the last man. The Silverbloods may be powerful, but they didn't have an actual army at their disposal, unlike the recently mobilized Jarl, a shame to lose my attack dog so early, but such is life, Thonar thought with some disappointment, before his brother drew his attention. As I told you we shouldn't have relied on the bloody barbarians. Thongvor, the brother who carried the actual title of Thane in the family, hisses, if Igmund catches even a whiff of this, we are dead no matter our influence or money. I know, brother, 
Thonar grits out, which is why we must kill them all and let none escape to tell the tale. Before the elder brother could respond, the massive mine entrance shuddered as magic struck against it, bursting open in the next instant and letting hundreds of furious forsworn into the city of Markarth with only a thin shield wall of heavily armoured men stopping their advance. Thonar, Madanak calls out as he steps in front of his men, an axe of bone in one hand and raging crimson magicka in the other. I am afraid that our cooperation has come to an end. You will not live to return to your little mountain hole, filth. Thonar snarls back and raises his hand in preparation for ordering an attack. Indeed, he will not. The powerful voice of Markarth's Jarl resounds across the small section before the mine, drawing all eyes to a rocky outcropping of the mountain wall atop which stood Igmund, surrounded by many of his thanes, noticeably including a certain wrath, now wearing proper noble clothing. Madanak grew so furious, it was a surprise he did not die of a heart attack then and there. Ig Igmund, Thongvor stutters in fear, I can expire. Shut your whore mouth, Silverblood, Igmund snarls before turning to the Forsworn King, you. The Jarl looks at the older Reachman with pure hatred. I will have you beg for mercy before having your soul rent from your body. Being the far more decisive of the two brothers, Thonar grabbed Thongvor by the shoulders and hissed, We need to get out of here, now. I am afraid it is far too late for that, Silverblood. Ingmund, who somehow managed to hear him, voices loudly, None of you are leaving this place alive. The Jarl's words caused a large commotion in the Silverblood's ranks, as most of the men realized they were well and truly fucked. Before anyone could truly react, the sound of metal hitting stone resounded across half the city, as the stomping of armoured boots signalled the advance of Markarth's guard and newly formed legionary contingent. The renowned heavy infantrymen of the city were all gathered in one spot for the first time since the Great War, and the slaughter they were about to bring would be absolute. The rebels' chances were not helped by the ten men wearing full-plate armour and wielding blazing greatswords emerging from one of the passages, soon followed by a wall of spearmen. The shield walls that formed around the rebels and forsworn were far more imposing than anything the Silver Bloods managed to do, as the Jarl's men looked to be outright impenetrable. The tension grew with each moment as the warriors entered a stare down. It was all broken as Igmund finally voiced, kill them all. To call what came after a fight would be giving it too much credit. Calling it a massacre would be far more apt as the forces of the city crashed into their gathered enemies and started butchering them indiscriminately, cutting them down with ruthless efficiency, yet not breaking ranks for even a moment. Though even the mechanical butchery of the Markarth soldiery fell short when compared to the sheer bloodletting frenzy the Knights of Evermore entered upon reaching their foe. Each swing of their greatswords cut a man in two, Sometimes even multiple would be hewn as the rags of the Forsworn failed to even slow the swings of the knight's mighty weapons. Madanak was a very old man by now, used to suffering and to defeat, so the moment he saw where the battle was going, he decided to make his escape. It was cruel. It was treasonous. But his people needed him, and no one else would unite the Reachmen before they were all culled by Skyrim's arch-witch. The stories he heard made even him, the man who faced down the entirety of Skyrim, afraid. His brave followers threw themselves into their doom without hesitation as they realized what was about to happen. Not once did they look upon their king with betrayal in their eyes or despair in their hearts. One by one they fell as they managed to push through a weak link in the enemy formation. Madanak's bodyguard, Borkul the Beast, being the last to fall as the massive man literally threw himself onto a shield wall to clear a path, the last of which was opened by a fireball coming from the king in rags himself. Without hesitation, the old reachman dashed down the winding streets of the ancient stone city which was once his, zigzagging through the familiar stone pathways in an attempt to shake off his pursuers, their heavy armors giving the beggar king a chance at an escape. As he finally managed to slip into a hidden alleyway, he allowed himself to take a deep breath of relief, only for said breath to hitch and get stuck in his throat as he beheld what awaited him inside. A wall of blackened halberds faced him from each direction, even from behind he came to realize 
the emotionless masks of the Dunmeri staring down at him judgingly as their comrades stood behind them with crossbows raised. A duo of extremely pale elves also stood behind the formation, but they made no move as a tall figure emerged from the shadows next to them. And it was at that moment that Madanak knew his people would not know freedom. Still, in an act of desperation, he gathered all of his magicka and called forth the fire within his soul, aiming to take as many of the elves with him as he could. Only for his arm to be seized by a sudden force, the raised hand of Torig's arc witch, twitching only slightly and immediately tearing, said arm off without even the slightest bit of resistance. Madanak wanted to curse the damned witch with all he had, but the same force which removed his arm had enveloped him wholly, not even allowing him to speak. Two crimson embers stared at him imperiously, feeling so far above him he might as well have been staring at the very heavens. The Reachman attempted one last utterance, but all he managed was a strained gurgle as the elf raised a finger in front of his masked mouth and muttered out a, Shh, sleep now. Raven twisted his hand and Madanak knew no more. Chapter 235 Leaving Markarth and a Princely Meeting Raven's POV I make a show of dusting my hands as the limp dead body of Madanak falls head first onto the pavement. Well, that is that dealt with. To think this man was once king of this city. Alor mutters, his tone contemplative, and then just like that. He snaps his fingers. Gone. Poof. Davos chuckles at the confused Falmer and claps him on the back lightly. You will get used to it, kid. Crown or no crown, it is just another dead fool. Nightshade stares down at the corpse coldly, getting a nod of agreement from Serana, who had been hiding out nearby. That he is. I clap my hand to stop any further banter and point toward a duo of my men. Bring him with us. I trust that Jarl Igmund will be very happy to learn that his old enemy didn't manage to slip through the cracks. A moment later, I hear the two Dunmer hoist the corpse up and we start moving. As we walk down the streets, a small crowd gathers around us, though none are quite so stupid enough as to try and approach too closely. I can already hear the rumors spreading. I muse aloud, and are already making plans on milking them for all they are worth. Davos deadpans. I pretend to swoon, causing some of the onlookers to step back in either surprise or disgust. You know me so well. Davos immediately palms his face in regret. Why do I even bother? Pardon me, my lord. Alor interjects. But won't the Jarl be angry now that he cannot deliver his vengeance personally? I stop and round at the snow elf with a raised eyebrow. You think he can say or do anything to me? Alor blinks before his face twists into an amused expression. No, I guess he cannot. What do you mean you already bloody killed him? Igmund snarls at me. Well, that was unexpected. My face doesn't even twitch as I repeat myself. Exactly what I have said. He is dead and this whole ordeal is over. I also note Aelor giving me a wry look out of the corner of my eye. You! He seems just about ready to start ranting at me, but whatever rationality he seems to have left wins out and he takes a deep breath instead. Apologies, I have looked forward to beating the bastard to death for so long that I could not hold back. Understandable. I accept the offered olive branch. What about the silver bloods? Both surrendered. Igmund scoffs like complete idiots. Well, no sovereign guard for them, I guess. I shrug, earning myself a dark chuckle from the Jarl. Their public execution is scheduled for tomorrow morning, and their family is to be banished to their distant cousins in solitude, where they will be someone else's problem. Igmund explains, I'd love to put their heads on pikes, but I don't need the Stormcloak getting support for no good reason. That would be most unwise, I offer neutrally, though it might have been better to just get rid of the brothers without anyone knowing a thing. At least the public execution will serve to assure the people that the source of the Forsworn was dealt with. Aye, the Jarl nods somewhat tiredly. Their raids have been driving me insane, and with them at least cowed I will be able to focus on the war effort. What of he Silverblood's holdings, I ask, simply out of curiosity. Spread under the dominion of wealthier commoner families and under the purview of a number of thanes, most notably the Sidna silver mine will be given to Thane Rath now that he has proven his loyalty. 
He has actually put thought into this. I might need to re-evaluate him. Our daring infiltrator. I tilt my head. Fitting, I guess. I did not do it because it is fitting, Igman scoffs. I did it because the young one is so focused on pleasing me, he won't have the time to plot behind my back. I notice the topic of our conversation, currently dragging a corpse with the common soldiery and chatting them up. One deeper scan later, which he could obviously not sense, and I offer Igmund a nod of approval. You are not wrong there. The Jarl gives me an appraising look before seemingly understanding what I did and suddenly looking a fair bit more cautious about that execution. You do not want me there? I cut straight into the meat of it. A wise decision. I can't be having the sto- He stops suddenly and blinks at me in surprise. Wait, you agree? Yes. I deadpan. I have no need to stand on ceremony when everyone that matters will know what happened. And there is no need to give Ulfric more anti-elf propaganda material. He mutters a, well, that was easier than I hoped, to himself probably thinking that I cannot hear him, and looks up at me, how much longer do you plan on staying in the city? We will leave today. I say bluntly, there are many issues I need to deal with, and I have already dawdled here long enough. I wish you a pleasant celebration tonight. Seemingly feeling both ashamed and put out, he offers me a strained smile, followed by the customary offer of friendship. Thank you for your help, Flame Tongue. Know that you will always be welcomed within my halls. And you in mine. I offer in return, and after a strong handshake, leave the Jarl to his plans. Just as I am about to return to my people and finally depart from the city, I notice Reno and his men boasting to each other about how well they did in the battle. They were so boisterous, in fact, that they nearly missed my approach until I was right behind them. Ah, Reynold rounds on me. Court mage, I trust that you have caught the vile ruffian. I have, I nod. However, I have no time to recount my deeds, as I have come to tell you that I will be leaving the city within the hour. But, but what about the celebration? Reynold seems genuinely distraught. Duty waits for no man or myrrh, I am afraid, I say, pretending to be disappointed which seems enough to placate him, as he nods sadly. I see. His expression brightens. Very well, then. Know that we shall raise a toast in your name, and rest assured, good sir, that the wards you have placed under our protection will find neither harm nor sorrow under our care. Good to hear. I smile at the man. See you on the battlefield night, Captain. You can bet on that, court mage. He raises his sword in a salute, and all of his men follow him a bit too dramatically. If I didn't see them butcher a bunch of idiots barely an hour back, I'd call them complete posers. Scorch quips. Why not both? I ask back, earning a shrug, and head toward my group. It was time to finally leave this city behind and focus on the bigger problems looming ahead of us. By the time we reached solitude four days later, the first snows had already started falling, and even covering certain mountains, the Skyrim weather was always harsh, but this winter looked to be an exceedingly unpleasant one for those less fortunate with their lot. Honestly, the weather bothered me far more than the bunch of idiot bandits who thought that raiding my party was a good idea. Needless to say, the roads were just a tad safer after we passed and an entire bandit camp had been thoroughly integrated back, into the soil. The distant skittering of a massive spider would forever haunt those that were allowed to escape and spread the tale of their fate. As we ascended up toward the noble quarter of the city, I got a perfect view of the massive solitude sprawl and saw it appear far more bustling than I ever would have guessed, as even while it still looked somewhat ramshackle and destitute in certain areas, I could see large amounts of workers milling about a large marketplace while many a new shop was opened all across the vast quarter. The fact that I had a hand in this newfound prosperity did bring a smile to my face a smile which only widened as I saw my dearest lady Ellenwyn riding out of the city and nearly made her fall of her horse in reaction to my focused gaze. It took the legionary guardsmen one good look at me and they immediately let me inside the city and after telling my people to make themselves at home in the mage's tower, I made my way toward the throne room, drawing many looks from the visiting lesser nobility. I even got to experience seeing a kid playing at being me while destroying his friends with a mighty fireball. That got a good chuckle out of me.
The house carls saluted as I entered the throne room, the lesser nobility parting in front of me like water before a rock as I approached Torrig, who was currently busy talking to General Tullius and his steward Falk Firebeard about troop movements, while his ever-stoic bodyguard Bulgir Bearclaw stood vigilantly to his right. The High King was the first to notice my approach, his expression immediately brightening and quickly drawing the looks of his two companions. The steward nodded in greeting, though most of his gaze was still locked firmly onto the map he was holding. The general simply stared at me, only letting out a short hum in greeting, evidently being curious as to why I was here. Well, I could always tell him I work here. I muse but choose to not waste time and instead offer the High King a short bow, King Torig. The young king lets out an exasperated huff at the formality, but seeing as we were currently being stared at by a bunch of petitioners, even if they were mostly out of hearing range, he chose not to comment on it. Instead, he smiled in greeting. Finally, you return, Raven. I thought I would never get to introduce little Trigvi to the reason he still has a father. I raise an eyebrow at that. There is no need for such dramatics, but I wouldn't mind meeting your whelp. Torig points at me with faux accusation. That is your prince you are talking about. He japes. A thousand pardons your kingliness. I bow dramatically. It won't happen again. We stare at each other for a moment before bursting into laughter. Apparently someone was not as amused as Tullius cleared his throat and began, If you are quite done. And Torig had the decency to at least look ashamed. I, of course, had no such issues and simply turned to the general. Yes, General Tullius. We have been hearing all manner of rumours coming forth from Markarth, mostly about your sudden presence there. His gaze turns a fair bit sterner. Then, then came the news of the deposition of an entire clan and the death of the missing king of the Reachmen. The general shares a quick look with Torig, who nods and speaks. An explanation would indeed be welcomed here. As you wish, I nod and pointedly glance toward the petitioners, though we may wish to retire to a less acoustic environment. And so we did, just after Torig made sure that no proud noble was offended by it, of course. No need to antagonize people needlessly, especially when you are currently busy with a statewide civil war. I gave them a full report on both the cults, the Forsworn and the Silver Bloods, even going so far as to regale them of the capabilities of the Breton knighthood, which earned a very satisfied smirk from Falk a truly rare occasion. General Tullius was also very satisfied with the development, the lack of troops from Markarth was starting to be noticed at the front lines, and while the city's force of heavy infantry was not going to be all that useful, with the current skirmish-focused phase of the war, they would still allow for other troops to focus on such tasks instead. Torig was simply happy that his people were now under less risk, and even swore that he would make sure the innocent silver bloods would find their place in his city, an offer he also wanted to extend to some of the less fanatical forsworn once they calmed down somewhat. By the time we were done, the sun had already set, and the general and steward left me and the king to our own devices. Torig wasting no time in practically dragging me to his private quarters, and before a surprised Elisif. The Queen Consort of Skyrim had been angry with me for a fairly long time after the King's Moot debacle, as I was the one who made sure she could not leave her room at the time. Motherhood had seemingly mellowed her out, and the young woman greeted me warmly and without a hint of her earlier fury. Torig had a goofy smile on his face as he showed his son off, going on and on about how he had his eyes or his cheekbones or any other minute detail. Both Elisif and I shared a look of exasperated amusement as he kept praising his months-old child to me. I did make sure to scan the child and took great pleasure in telling the parents that he was in perfect health. Elisif, being rather tired from her over-energetic brat's antics, shooed us out of the room not long after. Torig let out a tired but contented sigh. What a woman, he mutters. Kindly drool over your wife when I am not there. I quip causing the young king to scratch the back of his head in embarrassment. His look suddenly turns a fair bit more serious as he asks how long until it arrives. Just about a year or so, I can't make a precise prediction, but any later would be odd, I inform him flatly, though I fail to suppress the mix of dread and excitement that appears in the back of my mind. 
so we still have time. Torig nods. I have been making sure to have the cities prepare, but the mere thought of those beasts attacking even solitude makes me dread the casualties. In this instance, I advise that you trust in the divines. I say cryptically, what does that even mean? Torig huffs. Not something that is mine to reveal, unfortunately. I shrug, though I advise you focus on dealing with your current predicament, as I may be unavailable for some time. Oh? Torig quirks an eyebrow, not overly worried about my apparent absence. What will you be doing? I offer him an annoyingly cryptical smirk, going hunting. You know, you could just tell me you were going to deal with the vampires. He deadpans. Watch out, Pops, he is learning. Chapter 236. Mephala's Reward. The large trade ship slowly nestled its way into Winterhold's still sleepy docks, the familiar morning fog bringing an involuntary smile to my face as I beheld the massive college which only I could see the true beauty of. My enraptured gazing was brought to a swift end, however, when the jolly fat captain whom I hired for this voyage made his way toward me, his legs surprisingly steady for his immense girth. It never fails to bring a sense of wonder to one's heart, no? The imperial man says in greeting, You have no idea. I say while turning around, You have my thanks for the ride, Captain Avinius. As agreed, you and your men can enjoy my hospitality free of charge. Before he can say anything, I quickly add, Just make sure none of them do something regrettable in their celebration. But of course, Lord Raven, he bows as much as his bulbous form would allow, My men shall be the picture of decorum. He quickly looks up toward the dock and offers a practiced, apologetic smile. Ah, but I must leave you now. We will be docking within ten minutes. At your leisure, Captain. I offer him a nod and return to looking at my home. Will that be all, Cassus? I ask as I finish signing yet another delivery order for my ever-expanding enterprise. My personal steward bows. That is all for today, my lord. I wish you a pleasant evening. As he leaves me alone, I lean back into my chair and let out a contented sigh. Our arrival back to Winterhold was a relatively subdued affair, all things considered. Most of my subjects just wanted to take some time off and rest, while Serana wanted to retreat to the library due to a sudden bout of inspiration she had when she saw me playing around with restoration magic and realized she could actually cast it now. I shudder at the thought of the monster I've inadvertently created. Speaking of monsters, the massive spider from Markarth was successfully transported without anyone noticing and was now nesting in the lowest reaches of my underground base. I could not wait to start blasting the disgusting creature with rituals and see what came out. Back onto less dread-inducing topics, I spent most of my day completing the large backlog of documentation that was waiting for my signature. Carsus's work was impeccable, so I only had to do so much but it still surprised me just how much paperwork had to be done when running an expanding enterprise. Not that I minded at all, such work could even be relaxing from time to time, it was like watching your treasury fill up in real time, in small dosages of course. The world, being what it was, did not deign to let me relax for long however, as a sudden feeling of foreign anticipation scratched at my senses. At least she announced herself this time. Resigning myself to my fate, I allowed myself to blink, and the scene of my study was replaced with its n-webbed copy in the realm of the Daedra, my guest appearing right in my lap, her hand snaking over my shoulders and her face contorted into a cheeky yet still wildly seductive smile. I deadpanned at her and refused to acknowledge her presence any further until she got her ass off of me. She pouted, but did finally get up after a bit. Elegantly dusting herself off, she spoke. You know a lady might think herself unwanted if she is always welcomed with such eyes. Says the one who decided to barge into my life without an invitation. My deadpan expression doesn't even twitch. Part of your life, am I? She teases and pretends to swoon. How bold. And a good evening to you, Prince Mafala. I finally let my bored facade crack as I incline my head in greeting. What brings you here? Your reward, of course, she responds happily. Don't tell me you forgot. Priorities. I shrug, though now that you mention it, what happened to the mace? Mafala places a finger over her mouth and winks. Now that would be telling. 
I raise an eyebrow, but quickly realizing that she wasn't about to spill the beans, I shrug once more. Fair enough. Might as well focus on something useful. What kind of reward were you planning to give me then? Eager, are we? She teases before snapping her fingers and making what looked like an incredibly attractive Dunma woman, wearing a beautiful but not eye-catching dress and armed with numerous hidden knives next to her. What drew my attention, however, were the woman's vacant eyes. And this is, I ask disinterestedly. This, Mephala says grandly, is Mephis. And, I raise an eyebrow, you really can be difficult sometimes. She pouts but doesn't seem truly irritated. As I was saying, this is Mephis, what you may call a blank slate, a servant you can mould however you desire that will serve your every single need. Ah, yes, because looking at a braindid myrrh is no doubt going to make me want to ravish her. I deadpan at Mephala's suggestive tone. The Daedra giggles melodiously. Do not worry, she isn't as useless as you might imagine. She is, in fact, rather powerful and will be able to sniff out any and all assassins on mere instinct alone. Getting warmer, my prince, I quip, though why did you choose to give her to me specifically? Now that, my dear, is a surprise, she winks. Of course. I deadpan again. Fine, not like I am not going to have a use for her. Just out of paranoia, I give the woman construct thing a quick scan with my magic, and another with my system for good measure. I pointedly do not react to what I find. That is great to hear, dear. Mephala smiles and snaps her fingers. I get the contract notification, which is worded clearly for once. The lengths that she was willing to go for her little trick to work would have been funny if not for the constant spiking of my paranoia happening at the same time. I offer my mental assent, and the construe, or Mephis, I guess, offers me a deep bow as we both feel the distant connection fall into place. My thanks for your gift, Prince Mephala, I say after a beat of silence. I did say it would be a gift for the both of us. She winks. Do make sure to summon her as soon as possible. I must return to my domain now. Have a pleasurable day, I offer, and the vision ends. I blink once again, now staring at the no longer web-covered walls of my study and let out a truly tired sigh. I hoped that whatever Mephala was merely something along the lines of her usual thottery, because I was not about to walk into her scheme unprepared. With a flick of my hand, the staff of Magnus appears in my grasp, already glowing with its near-divine power, and like a wave starting from myself, hundreds upon hundreds of minuscule Magnusite runes start covering the floor and walls, and even the ceiling after a while. My room became a complete and utter death trap, meant to direct the entirety of the power I could extract from the eye of Magnus at whoever found themselves in its centre. Taking a deep breath, I center myself and mentally invoke my connection with my newest summon. Less than a heartbeat later, Mephis simply blinks into existence at the center of my room, looking far more animated and alive than the last time I saw her, though her amused expression shifts into one of surprise as the entire room starts glowing with power, all of it aimed straight at her. With narrowed eyes and a proverbial twitching trigger finger, I calmly ask, Kindly explain to me what exactly you are trying to do here, or I will make what happened with Meridia seem like a fucking joke. Mephis, or more accurately, the small fragment of Mephala blinks in surprise before her face is overtaken with a rapturous expression. Oh, you just keep on getting better and better. She mumbles to herself, the hunger in her voice evident. Mephala, I grit out, explain. What is there to explain? She tilts her head, completely uncaring about the mass of magic aimed at her. I wanted to have some fun and help you in the process. Is that so wrong? Ah, yes. My eye twitches. Help me by using me to enter the world and do as you will. She scoffs lightly. Come now, Raven. You know well enough that I can only use so much of my power to influence the world before that annoying dragon interferes. Besides, I did not lie when I said I wanted to help you. Not lying. I drawl, like you didn't lie when you failed to inform me of my new servant's more quirky features. I simply forgot. She smiles sunnily. I exhale heavily before allowing a smirk to form on my face. You seem to have failed to take one little thing into account with your little plan. Oh? She leans in, genuinely curious. Instead of answering her, I send a mental command toward her body, 
and without any control from the fragment of the Daedra itself, it immediately takes a seat. I would have been smug as all hell if not for the entertained glint in her eyes that followed. Oh my! Mephala gasps falsely. It seems I am at your mercy. You wanted this, I say flatly and with a fair bit of disgust. I am certain I have no idea what you are talking about, dear, the unmoving Daedra says cheekily. I stare at her for a while without uttering a word before slowly palming my face and letting out a tired groan. Apparently I forgot just who I was dealing with. The folly of youth. Mephala sighs dramatically. Whatever. I roll my eyes and deactivate the ward array, allowing the runes to dissipate and the stone bricks to return to their original unmarred forms. Mephala tilts her head. I expected a bit more resistance if I am being honest. Would it have changed anything? I ask blandly. No, is her cheerful response. A quiet knocking on my doors interrupts our conversation, and a moment later Davos enters my study, his eyes immediately landing on the seated Daedra. I didn't see any guests enter, he mutters, a bit alarmed. This one is rather special, I say wryly, earning a beaming smile from my guest. Davos, this is Mephis, an important guest. He merely offers a disinterested nod and a bland, a pleasure. Though I do notice him taking in each and every bit of information he could gather from her presence, his mild disrespect, probably an attempt of getting anything out of her. What did you need, Davos? I ask him, ignoring the incredibly amused Daedric Prince, currently planning on how best to scare the shit out of my right-hand man. A Nord scholar of some repute by the name of Katria wants to see you, says she has information about some kind of old Dwemer secret and wants your cooperation in finding it. Katria, Katria, hmm. I scratch my chin thoughtfully. It's the magic uranium, Scorch informs me after a moment. That one? I blink, my rapidly changing expression no doubt entertaining my guest greatly. Seeing no reason to deny her, I nodded at Davos. Send her up. Sure thing, boss, he salutes. But just as he's about to leave, Mephis speaks up. My thanks for your hospitality, Lord Dagoth. I am tired and need some rest. Would you please let your man here lead me to a place to stay? Davos immediately gives her an odd look, his own paranoia no doubt spiking like mad. But unfortunately for him, I have had way too much Daedric bullshit for one day, so I simply say, but of course, Davos, escort the fair lady to one of the servants' rooms. Earning myself an amused snort from the rogue. Poor guy, he has no idea what he is getting himself into, Scorch laments. Mephis! Eye twitches, but she doesn't say anything. Oh no, she was far too entertained by the prospect of fucking with Davos to even bother pretending to care about her accommodations. Probably had something to do with the fact that she could retreat the fragment of her consciousness from that body at will. As the two leave, I send a quick prayer to the gods for Davos's safety and lean back into my chair, massaging a burgeoning headache. Chapter 237 Stirring the Dawn Guard General POV. Davos, was it? His lord's guest asks, her voice carrying a hint of dangerous intrigue. Really should have asked boss just who in oblivion this is exactly. Davos grumbles internally before offering the woman a disinterested shrug. That's the name. Oh, I've heard so much about you. Mephis squeals just loudly enough to catch a couple of passing glances from the guards, but not enough to draw actual attention. A myrrh born in the lowest dregs of Windhelm's elf prison, only to join the local guild, and then rise to the position of a great lord's right hand. Truly an inspiring tale. Why does she know that? I made sure that no one talked about me. Davos panics slightly, but keeps his expression from changing. You know much. Too much, some would say. Mephis winks and lets out a peal of mildly unnerving ufufu laughter. Right. Davos furrows his brows as his mind goes into overdrive, attempting to connect the dots. One question bothering him far more than anything else. Why does she feel familiar? So cautious, his charge tuts. That is no way to treat a lady. What would your lord think? Well, you've said it yourself. I am a filthy gutter rat. Davos carefully keeps up his careless facade as his mind keeps listing through all the faces and voices he has heard throughout his life. How dull. Mephis sighs dramatically, one would expect that spending so much time at Raven's side, 
you would have gotten at least a bit more of his cheek. This is growing more uncomfortable by the second. Davos suppresses the urge to start questioning her then and there. Someone has to watch the kids back. Wait, why the fuck did I just say that? Is that so? The stunning woman, no, the stunning lady gives him a curious once over before gently tapping his back. How dedicated. A shiver of something runs down his spine and he thanks all of the gods when they reach their destination only a few moments later. There you go, lady. Enjoy your stay and know that dinner is served in about two hours, so make sure not to miss that. His voice was audibly tense now. Time passes so quickly when you are having fun. Mephis pouts before offering him a bright smile. Well, it isn't like we don't all the time in the world. Enjoy your day, little Davos. Still a bit out of it, Davos only nods and turns to leave before he stops moving altogether. Little Davos. The short Dunmer's brain short circuits as his entire mind is overtaken by the memory of a certain knight in the Blue Palace's mage tower. Oh no, he says with despair clear in his voice. Finding himself unable to move, he can only stare at the wall as two dainty hands coil around his shoulders from behind as Mephis takes a deep inhale right next to his ear and ecstatically whispers, Oh yes. Raven's POV. Scorch and I both let out a loud synchronous wheeze as we observe Davos having a small mental breakdown while literally being embraced by his patron deity. I knew Mafala wouldn't do anything to him, as that wasn't her style, but a small part of me did still feel bad. I really should get that man something nice for all the trauma he gets from serving me. One should maintain one's farm tools properly, young master. Scorch points out pompously and disappears before I have the time to smack him. A subdued knock saves the bird's life as I telekinetically open the door, letting in a mature, gnawed woman wearing a mix of robes and light armor into my study. Though it wasn't the clothes that drew most of my attention, it was the ridiculous amount of leather-bound books she had attached to nearly every conceivable spot of her outfit. The wind-enchanted bow hanging off her back was also worthy of some note. Catria, I presume, I ask while pushing a chair forward and allowing her to take a seat. The woman almost topples over from the weight of her cargo, but writes herself just in time, almost as if she had practiced the movement prior, and directs her eyes toward me. I flame tongue, Dwemer scholar and historian Katria, at your service. She attempts to offer a slight bow, but hearing the chair creak, she settles on an inclination of the head. I hear you have an offer for me, I ask, and she nods enthusiastically. Just as she is about to begin her tale, her excitement obvious, I raise a forestalling hand. Why don't you make yourself comfortable first? One sheepish look and one ungodly stack of books. Later she begins her tale and she keeps going, and going, for the entire hour. I felt like stopping her at multiple points, but I had to admit, the woman could spin an enticing story, and I simply let her keep spinning, even if I knew that at least a third of what she said was bullshit. So, to summarize, I say, as she finally finishes her tale, you claim to have written the book The Ethereum Wars, a rather well-known work at this point, and the credit for writing said book was then stolen by your apprentice, one Taran Dreth, yes? She nods enthusiastically. And you want me to help you find the fabled Ethereum of the Dwemer, so you could prove to be the original author? I ask with some incredulity. The nodding continues before she recognizes the doubt in my voice. Oh, you don't need to worry about compensation. I only need the proof. You can keep the Ethereum for yourself after we are done. I blink slowly. Is she that hyper-focused on her dispute or just plain stupid? Why not both, bird boy quips. I see. I frown. Your offer is... She covers her mouth with both hands, fear evident in her eyes. Oh, please don't tell me I've travelled all the way from Falkreath to be ignored. I need proof of my work, divines, damn it. Acceptable, I finish while giving her a slightly exasperated look. She at least had the decency to look sheepish. Before she can grow too excited, I add... Though I will be unable to personally aid you with the search, I will send one or two of my own along with a few guards. Is that acceptable? I was obviously going to arm them to the teeth and drown them in automatons, but she didn't need to know that now. Yes, she squeaks in surprise. That is far more than I expected, truth be told. Does she really not know the value of the Ethereum? I pointedly do not raise an eyebrow as genuine bafflement bubbles within my mind. 
Instead, I telekinetically ring a small bell outside of the room, causing a guard to open the door and pair inside. Call Idrasa and Eldor, I say simply. The armoured Dunmer bows deeply. At once, my lord. Ah, I can't wait to see her face when I tell her she is about to be trudging through caves for months to come. Idrasa's face was indeed priceless, but only for a brief moment, as she understood that as much as this was a challenge, it was also an opportunity to madly enrich herself and build something of a power base within the house if she played her cards right. She was not stupid enough to try and hide her ambitions from me, so I allowed it. Before Davos could find me and start threatening my poor, innocent hide, I quickly found Serana, who was engrossed in some reading at her usual spot in the library, and invited her for a visit to the Dawn Guard. My bullshit senses were tingling, and Harkon's goons have been quiet for some time now. No doubt the moth priest was already wondering Skyrim and I would get news of his location soon enough. As for why I wanted to bring the literal vampire progenitor to a den of vampire hunters, I simply did not care to tiptoe around the situation just so people could be comfortable. No one would be dumb enough to stir shit up too far in my presence anyway. Well, if they valued their lives anyways. And so, just as Davos was about to barge into the library with a panicked look on his face, I grabbed Serana by the shoulder and tugged on my connection with the bar of silver sitting at the center of Fort Dawnguard. A blink later, we found ourselves standing in the center of the vast circular keep at the heart of the old fortress. A startled young Nord jumping away from us with a shrill eep. I simply stared at him wordlessly until he got uncomfortable and ran to fetch Izran. Serana, who had become a fair bit more expressive since her time in Markarth, gives me an amused look, and this is who they wanted to send to hunt us. I shrug. Kid can probably point a crossbow well enough. Kid, Serana raises an eyebrow, are you not of a similar age yourself? I make a shushing gesture with my finger and wink, now that would be telling. Before the confused vampire can even process my words, the ever-intense leader of the Dawnguard barges into the central hall, his eyes immediately zeroing in onto my companion and the scroll hanging on her back. Then something completely unexpected happens. Instead of attempting to cleave her head from her shoulders with a blunt object, he merely grits his teeth and turns to me before grinding out, Come with me. A couple of curious glances are sent our way by those dawn guard grunts present in the fort, but as they see us walking about with Isran, they soon return to their jobs, completely ignoring the glaringly obvious vampire in their midst. Fresh recruits? I ask conversationally. The large red guard allows himself an amused grunt, yes. We finally step into a private room, and the moment we are out of sight of anyone else, Isran rounds on the two of us and glares at me. What in the God's name are you thinking? That cooperation is vital, and that dancing around the subject would just make us less efficient. I list off dryly, What did you think I brought her here simply to fuck with you? That immediately earns me a look of doubt, but he doesn't voice it and instead looks to Serana. And why would you fight your own kind? He is still full of hatred, but my display the last time I was here gave him an excuse to mellow out a little bit as I was far above him in power, and he could just blame me for everything. The leader of the clan is insane, Serana answers coldly. What he wants would bring an end to both vampires and the mortals. I snort, as if his little attempt could stop the sun for long. Both of them give me surprised looks, Serana being completely stunned by the revelation, it isn't permanent? Of bloody course it isn't. I snort. It would still last long enough to massively damage society, but it wouldn't be a true apocalypse. True apocalypse or no, the threat must be stopped, Isran says firmly. And I am not disputing that. I nod in assurance, merely pointing out Harkon's arrogance. Hmm, an arrogant foe is one that can be trapped, Isran muses, but his focus quickly returns to the present. Why are you here exactly? See the glowy scribble on Serana's back. I ask, and take Isran's scowl as confirmation. Her father is under the impression that she is returned into the fold with it, so he has spread rumors about the scroll in an attempt to lure a moth priest into the province and capture him. And you wish to use him to read it for us instead? Isran asks. I already have a vague idea of what it contains, but some additional confirmation will be useful, even if we will probably have to find multiple. 
I sigh at that last bit. Going to that place was not going to be fun. Is there anything certain about its contents that you can share? The Red Guard questions, earning me a curious look from Serana as well. The bow of Oriel will either curse the sun or protect it. I say with finality, though internally I was already prepared for a couple of workarounds if the Daedra got creative. I did have the sword of ultimate nope with me after all. Oriel's bow, Isran mutters. Such a weapon would definitely be useful in our situation if anything. The bow of a god, Serana asks almost at the same time. Something like that is still on Nern. I flick Magnus's staff into my hand and raise an eyebrow, causing the vampire to look away in a brief flash of embarrassment. So you need to find the moth priest. Isran puts the conversation back on track. What must we do? Nothing, I shrug. Just keep patrolling against vampire attacks. They have been growing in frequency, but your people have already gotten some renown in hunting them down. A brief beat of silence passes before Isran voices a firm, No. No? I tilt my head, and why exactly not? The Red Guard frowns. You have been doing the hardest work yourself. The more skilled among us are starting to get frustrated by relying on you to do everything for them. We need a victory. I cup my chin. Hmm. A fair point. I finally say, send them to Whiterun and I will contact them whenever I find the priest's relative location. Who will be leading them? I will. Isran's eyes burn with determination. Chapter 238. Morthal. It took my people only a couple of days to find a bunch of rumors about the moth priest moving about. A bit slower than I would have liked, but I was running them ragged across the whole province already, and finding him wasn't an absolute priority. Even if Isran would probably attempt to glare me to death again if he learned that little tidbit. From what we learned, the old priest going by the name of Dexian intended to visit the college, but as he passed by Whiterun, he caught wind of a rumor about a scroll being held somewhere close to Morthal. Naturally, the old fool ran there like a complete idiot with only two guards and has not been heard from in days, if not longer. And these guys were supposed to be priests of Julianos. Demented decision-making aside, I immediately moved out, only taking Serana and Mephis with me, much to Davos's immense relief. We had no need of transportation, as I could just unsummon the Daedra, and both Serana and myself could fly at immense speeds, so reaching Whiterun took us only a couple of hours. We met Isran early in the morning hours, many of the men he brought going to bed after the long night shift. He was not truly surprised I got the information so quickly, so we had his people ready to move out within a couple of minutes. Naturally, we weren't about to wait for a bunch of heavily equipped dawn guards to march their asses across the now cleared out Labyrinthian Pass, courtesy of Durak. So after giving Isran the information and promising that we were only going there to scout things out, we took to the skies once again and quickly found the poorest city in Skyrim. And by all the gods above what a shithole it was. The stinking marshland practically surrounded the central city while the rest spread outwards from the sickly-looking wooden walls in a way that, dare I say, was less organized than the original solitude sprawl. The center was raised atop a small hill or artificial dirt platform. I couldn't really get a good read, since if it was raised by humans, it happened thousands of years ago, when the region was still rich in bog iron and someone made an investment to populate the place. The houses in the center followed the usual Nordic style of architecture, no doubt meant to house the small number of wealthy or noble families living here, while the homes that were further out seemed to be standing on stilts and were all relatively small due to weight constraints. Yet with all of this, I still found myself liking the place more than I did Riften. Sure, Hjalmarch was a complete shithole when compared to the Rift, but at least the city did not radiate a near-visible aura of poverty and destitution like Riften did. As we approached dressed in travelling clothes, so as to not draw undue attention, I got a good look at the locals, and as I predicted from seeing some of them in solitude, they were all a bit lanky by Nord standards, and even with the Nord's respectable bathing habits, everyone seemed to look just a bit dirty to my sharp eyes. The guards were armed lightly, in form-fitting light armour that would not constrain them in the rough and dangerous terrain, and when the situation called for, it would even allow them to swim. They were all armed with freshly supplied steel-tipped spears and hand axes from Solitude, both of the weapons designed for both melee and throwing. 
Now As we stepped through the gates after making sure the guards didn't raise a fuss, I head Mephis take in a deep breath and exhale with a hum. Such a dreary and uninteresting place you've brought me to. Oh please, I roll my eyes. You've already noticed that something is going on here. But of course, Mephis tuts. What do you take me for? Do you really want the answer to that? I deadpan, causing her to giggle. Why don't you go and ply your trade while I deal with the boring politics? Already excluding me, are we? She raises an eyebrow, questioning me simply for the sake of doing it. I nod firmly and retort amusedly. Of course, now go and do your job. How commanding. She swoons lightly. Very well, I am off, your lordship. She offers one last wink and heads toward the tavern. I still do not like her, Serana mutters as Mephis leaves us alone. Why does she need to be here? All Serana knew about Mephala's meat puppet was that she was a Dremora, gifted to me by my patron that would follow all of my commands and was very adept at everything that had anything to do with being a rogue, from seduction to thievery to assassination. Her presence entertains my patron, and an entertained Daedra is a helpful Daedra. I explain easily as we head toward the Jarl's longhouse, a structure seemingly barely above the standards of the local nobility. Serana shifts uncomfortably. Trusting a Daedra is never a good idea. Trust? I turn to her with a raised eyebrow. True, I might trust that she will act in a certain way, because that is her want, I will never trust her as a person. Her servant. I barely stop myself from accidentally blurting, she is bound to me far more than any other Dremora out there. It takes only the lightest twitch of my intent, and she is back to the spiral skine. Still visibly uncomfortable with the idea, but somewhat assured by my words, Serana nods slowly. If you are certain. I am confident, but never certain. I shrug, but that is enough of that. It would seem the locals have prepared a welcoming drama for us. As I say that I point toward a crowd gathering in front of the Jarl's longhouse, armed with torches and pitchforks, a bunch of them yelling at who I guess is the hold steward. Why hasn't the Jarl done anything? One of the more well-dressed Nords in the crowd asks, We all know that the fire was no accident, so why have the guards not investigated yet? The steward takes a fortifying breath before speaking. The Jarl is already investigating the fire. I need you all to return to your homes and allow us to do our jobs. This unrest will bring us nothing. Threatening martial law already, eh, Asselfur? The presumed nobleman scoffs, as I expected. Before the steward can give his answer, the man waves for the crowd to follow him. Come on, people, we are obviously not getting anything out of him tonight. As the crowd disperses, many of them grumbling, the steward lets out a tired sigh. His troubles were, however, only beginning, because it was exactly at that moment that I decided to make my presence known by loudly clearing my throat. Asselfur turned to me, his eyes widening by a fraction as he recognized me even without my usual regalia. What are you doing here? He asks before he can compose himself. I raise an amused eyebrow but say nothing. Right, apologies. The tired man mumbles, Greetings, court mage. What brings you to Morthal? I seek a moth priest, I tell him plainly. Then you are out of luck. His shoulders sag. The Honorable Dexian has left the city five days ago, and the scouting party we sent after him found signs of struggle an hour's walk from the gates. Both him and the guards were gone without a trace to follow. My mind races briefly before I come to the obvious conclusion the local vampire Lord Wannabe was in cahoots with the Volkihar and was asked to hold the priest for them. Too bad for them, I decided to butt my nose into their dealings. Then it would seem our issues are one and the same, I say after a brief pause. The steward looks at me with obvious confusion. What do you mean by that? I would have thought you have gotten used to mages being cryptic by now, I muse. Suddenly he looks even more tired than before. You are like her then. The comparison offends me, but I do not wish to waste time with the specifics. I wave his question off, much to his chagrin. How come the Jarl was not able to see something was going on? He looks around worriedly before whispering, because the Jarl has been bedridden ever since this whole thing had begun. Whenever she tries to look into what is going on, she gets a painful headache and she can't quite control it. Of bloody course she cannot, I say dryly before muttering, bloody untrained fools. 
So you will help us? Asselfer asks, hopefully, not even bothering to ask about my capabilities. I will, I nod lightly. At least then the crone might actually learn her lesson, take the time to learn how to cast proper spells. It still irked me that the old woman constantly tried to instinctually cast a massively complex spell. Sure, she was talented in mysticism, but that did not make her any less of a weakling or the side effects any less problematic. The steward pointedly pretends to not hear the second part of my statement and instead asks, what do you need to know? The general idea of what happened for one. The man sighs tiredly once again and begins his tale. An honest working man by the name of Hrogar had apparently started seeing one of the less respected women of the city by the name of Alva, and a month later his home, including his wife and daughter, was burned. Many thought it to be an accident, but when Hrogar, without even mourning his loved ones, moved in with Alva and seemingly forgot them overnight, people got all kinds of suspicious. It took only one of the more opportunistic nobles to start stirring the issue up, and people were already walking the streets at night, many of them armed, in some vain attempt at hunting down the culprit. Funnily enough, no one dared enter Alva's home. Everyone was suspicious of her, yes, but no superstitious Nord was about to head into the bad Juju land without some very nasty weapons at his back. Just in case I do a quick scan of the city and hold back a grimace as a widespread ward seems to attempt to latch itself onto my mind, but finds both me and my spell too potent to do anything. At least I had the general location of its origin now, but I would still investigate the entire situation first. We did have to wait for the dawn guard to get here, and that would take at least a day, even with the shortcut. I see, I say as he finishes the story, there is certainly some kind of coercion going on there at the very least. Though I suspect the problem is greater than that. I will investigate the situation and see what I can do about it. The steward looks at me hopefully, thank you, and please inform me if you find anything. Naturally, I lie smoothly and quickly leave, followed by Sarana. You really seem to not like the Jarl. Sarana speaks up as we head toward the burned house near one of the taverns. She likes to play at being a seer, I grumble, rather offensive when you are a genuine seer yourself. Sarana actually giggles at this, oh, I did not take you to be so petty. My natural majesty usually hides it well. I raise my nose. We share a quiet chuckle and keep walking in pleasant silence. Speaking of seers, Sarana begins slowly, what do you actually know about what is going on? I quickly relay to her all I have surmised so far, including my suspicion, shared knowledge of vampires in the city itself. I did not have the actual location of the main vampire's lair, so finding the ones prowling the city would probably lead me to it. I was not about to spend my days searching for a single cave in a massive swamp, even if it killed me, and I would murder as many vampires as I had to prove that point. Chapter 239, Laid to Rest Mephala's POV My eyes roam the bustling tavern, the best one in the city supposedly, even if that did not say much, most of the mortals appearing utterly uninteresting and bland as my gaze passed them over. Well then, the girl approaching me catches my attention, this one might prove worthy of my attention. Tough day, sweetie? I smile pleasantly as the young tavern wench brings me my drink. She blinks, briefly startled by my melodious voice, and looks me over, a slight blush covering her cheeks as her eyes wander. I, um, we manage. She fidgets nervously. I tut at her, you manage? My face twisting into a light scowl, the slight gesture of support easily earning me the bored creature's trust. We can't have you falling over now, can we? Why don't you take a seat? I, I really shouldn't. She fidgets a rather pretty little thing, no doubt to be snatched by some lumberjack or marsh hunter to live a life of mediocrity in mere months. At least she showed off a bit of her figure while she still had it. Only shoulders and a bit of cleavage, and the Nords fall over themselves, the prudes. Oh, come now, what is poor little me going to do? I tap the bench to my right, my fingers moving hypnotically and her eyes following them in a daze. I am sure your employer won't mind you keeping me a bit of company, after all I am a well-paying customer. And just like that, the feigned hesitation disappears, and she sits down, a bit too close even. How very bold. I giggle breathily, sending a shiver down her spine. Now, my dear, 
I barely touch her exposed shoulder and she immediately looks away, her ears reddening. How about you entertain me with some intriguing gossip and in return? Her head immediately turns back to me, anticipation clear in her eyes. I do so love applying the personal touch to these things from time to time. Tempting mortals with your mere presence gets oh so boring after a while. Another thing to thank my not quite so mortal chosen for, I guess. My split second of thought was apparently too much for the little thing, as she asks, in return. I offer her a conspiratorial smile and whisper, I teach you how to snag yourself someone not completely worthless. She shivers for a moment as my breath caresses her reddened ear but suddenly composes herself. Her eyes now showing her hidden hunger instead of the well-practiced meekness she projected as her smile turns outright manic. It would be my pleasure. There is that hidden potential. Raven's POV. It is definitely burned, Serana points out helpfully. I give her a dry deadpan. And the award for detective of the millennium goes to Lady Volkihar, long may she reign. She rolls her eyes, visibly trying to be more expressive, as if you could tell more from a mere glance without magic. I can, in fact, I scoff. For example, this fire was obviously started by someone as the area around the fireplace is still relatively intact, while the edge where you can see the slightest remains of a bed has been burned the most. They could have dropped a candle, Serana tries lamely. I give her another deadpan. I am not really sure if you should be having such low standards for your own people. She raises her nose with false pomp, as if I would ever compare myself to mere peasants. I snort lightly and shake my head. All right, that is enough of that. We have a job to do, to which she nods. I had been spending some time in the past few days getting her to relax around people, at least slightly. Her paranoia wasn't gone, she still seemed jittery and at times even unhinged when certain powerful people were around, but she was getting a handle on it and even developed a bit of snark from her constant interaction with me. She was so company-starved it wasn't even funny. We searched around the house and within it after that, finding out small details about how the whole thing went down and even seeing the locks barred from what little remained of the door. Whoever did the deed made sure the family was unable to escape easily. I just hope they suffocated in their sleep instead of burning alive. Unfortunately, a bunch of people already went around the house multiple times, so no tracks were left to be followed, making any kind of mundane investigation unable to provide extra relevant information. Finally done satisfying my childish urge to play detective, I dust the ash from my gloves and cast a quick clairvoyance, just an underpowered version as I didn't want to alert whoever cast the ward too much. As the spell-induced hunch enters my mind, I mutter a huh. What is it? The bored voice of Serana reaches me. I frown. I just tried finding some hints, but it is pointing me toward the graveyard. Well, what are we waiting for? Serana, already moving, asks. The graveyard is that way. I lazily point in the exact opposite direction. She stops, takes an unnecessary breath, and wordlessly starts marching after me. General POV. A hooded woman knelt above a marked mound within the bounds of the Morthal graveyard, her pale hands shivering as she, she weaved her pathetically weak blood magic into summoning a spirit of the dead. The screams of the murdered child rang out in her mind as the silhouette of a little Nord girl appeared above the grave. Laylette, the small child exclaimed happily, here to play again? The fledgling of Alva shuddered at how cheerful the ghost seemed. Yes, dear, she croaked. We can play. The ghost of Helgi, the child of Hrogar, whooped loudly before rapidly asking, What are we going to play today? Can we do hide and seek? Please. Leolette smiled sadly and tried to get up, but suddenly realized that she couldn't so much as twitch as her shadow seemingly enveloped her. Even Helgi's ghost seemed to be rooted in place by an invisible force. For the briefest of moment, she felt an immense magical presence behind her, her senses screaming at her to get out of there as mere proximity threatened to burn her alive, before a calm voice tinged with barely restrained fury rumbled from the same spot. Well now, what do we have here? Raven's POV. Hey, the ghost of the child, whom I've allowed some movement, points at me. Let Laylet go. Patience, child. I raise my hand placatingly and approach the kneeling vampire, who grew more panicked by the second. 
I lay my hand on her shoulder, lightly digging the ebony gauntlets into her flesh. Tell me, vampire, were you the one to burn the house? I... Her words choke in her throat as the child's ghost gives her a curious look. I can feel your regret and self-loathing. What point is there in hiding the truth? I ask calmly, yet my fingers press even harder, now drawing blood, and slowly start charging my presence with positive magicka. The fledgling lets out a pained noise at that. She considers lying, but as her skin starts to flake, she thinks better of it. Yes. She hisses out. Hey, leave her alone, the child demands ineffectually, and tell me. I outright pierce her shoulder now. Did they suffer? She outright whimpers now. Yes. My eyes narrow, my aura shuddering out of control for a moment and half skinning the filth. And under whose orders did you commit the deed? I question harshly. I can feel her desire for the soul-searing pain to end battle the ingrained loyalty to her sire, but as usual self-preservation wins out as she mutters. The mutter quickly turning into a despaired yell. Alva, it was Alva. I see. I mutter and then command, be gone. And with a flick of my hand, summon a horde of tiny spiders who swiftly envelop and devour the creature. She did not even have the time to scream. Where did you send her? The child asks me innocently. She doesn't even realize. The realization strikes me to a better place. I settle on the complete opposite of the truth, my voice far less forceful than moments earlier. Can you take me there too? I really want to play with her. The child pleads, no, you really fucking don't. I give her a pitying look. Do you not want to see your mother? Something in the child's expression cracks. It hurt. She looks down. I don't want to hurt again. What is your name? I ask with a forced smile. Mine is Raven. I am Helgi, she pipes up with some of her earlier cheer. Using a bit of soul magic, I make it possible for my hand to lightly land atop her head. You need not fear Helgi. Nothing can hurt you any more. You promise? She asks after a moment's hesitation, the innocent look in her eyes making me barely hold back a growl of rage at her fate. I pat her head. I swear it on my name. I smile at her again. Go now. Your mother is waiting for you. It takes her a moment to gather her courage, but then, after offering one last hopeful smile, she disappears, hopefully into one of the more peaceful afterlives. I take a deep breath of the disgusting marshland air and turn back to Serana, who was already playing around with her extended claws while her legs were jittering with obvious signs of contained rage. So, I begin, my voice cold as ice. Wanna go stab a bitch? Her eyes flash a deep bloody red. Yes, yes, I very much do. The moment we passed by the city's central tavern, a shrouded figure fell into step beside us. Without even turning around, I asked, What did you find out? Mephis scoffs, This whole city is entirely uninteresting, only two dozen cheating couples, and a mere three of them doing anything barely worth mentioning, and they aren't even being creative about it, or so the rumours say. That is not what I asked, I deadpan, earning a giggle. Then you should have been more specific. Before I have the time to groan, she raises her hands placatingly. Fine you spoil sport, I learned about a bunch of locals disappearing over the past year or so. Apparently many of them were in contact with a certain Alva, a supposed seductress, drawing the gullible young men into lives of banditry and other equally idiotic claims. Blood thralls or recruits, Serana mutters, whoever is behind Alva is building a coven. A vampire, Mephis asks though her tone tells me she is unsurprised. I guess there are less subtle ways of telling the paranoid locals that you are a Daedra worshipper. Serana gives her an odd look at the apparent disdain in her voice, but she chooses not to comment. Our primary target is her master, I interject. She should have the information on their location. And our own blood fiend can force said information out of her. Mephis chuckles, ignoring Serana's glare. Well then, what are we waiting for? She asks and walks in front of us, straight toward Alva's home. I do not even try to be subtle as I simply kick down the wooden door with a dragon-skin-empowered foot, the slightly rotten wood splintering into tiny shards the moment my boot connects. A surprised Nord man, Hrogar, I presume, stands up from his dinner and goes to grab his axe, but I simply use telekinesis to smack him with a nearby pan, knocking him out on the spot. 
We continue our march through the house without pause, ripping off the cabinet, hiding the passage to Alva's coffin, and coming face to face with the very panicked vampire slowly getting out of said coffin. The massive blood-red runic matrix covering the entire room lights up for a brief moment but ceases just as quickly as stone spikes rise up in vital points of the ward, destabilizing it and turning it useless. That is what you get for using blood to draw your wards, you fucking amateur. Serana appears in front of Alva in a blur of movement and locks eyes with her. Who is your master? Serana asks. M ugh. Alva clutches her head in an attempt to resist the command, but it takes only the slightest glow coming out of Serana's eyes for the resistance to break completely as she drones in a completely dead tone, Morvarth. Did he recently capture the moth priest Dexian? Good thing she remembers the actual objective. Yes. Where is his lair? Serana presses. Four hours north of Morthal. Go east by Alchemy Farm. Pass hunting camp. Cave under large willow tree. Alva drones emotionlessly. Serana gives me a questioning look and one quick clairvoyance. Later I get a vague feeling of the general location and nod, signing Alva's death sentence as Serana lashes out with her claws, severing her head in one swift movement. That was satisfying, I mutter appreciatively. Serana gives me a weak smile. It was. If you are quite done with your little interrogation, there is a small crowd gathering outside. Mephis's cheery voice comes from upstairs. I groan. Chapter 240. Movarth. As I ascend the stairs and exit the now ownerless house, I come face to face with a small crowd of Nords the same crowd that was pestering the steward when I arrived in fact, and with the same nobleman from earlier standing in front of them and already getting his poor ass swiftly wrapped around Mephis's finger. It doesn't take him long to notice my silent hovering. You, what are you doing in there? He points at me and asks suspiciously. You don't look like a guard, I point out lazily. His face reddens slightly. I don't need to be a bloody guard to protect my home. Now what in oblivion did you do in there? I won't ask again. He grips the sheathed sword at his side, but his quivering legs give out his true feelings. Cute, I deadpan. But there is no need for pointless escalation here. I continue just before the man can blow up on me. The one you knew as Alva was a vampire, likely behind the multiple disappearances happening in the past months. I just finished killing her and freeing her newest thrall. The crowd goes completely quiet at my declaration, the nobleman frowning deeply and muttering, truly, but another priority seemingly takes over as he looks up with some hope. Hrogar is alive. Indeed, I nod. I simply knocked the man out before my compatriot ended the vampire. He should be all right after a couple days of rest, but his mind will be under understandable strain when he learns what happened. I. The noble nods sadly, though I do notice a raised eyebrow at the terminology I use, at least the man will live. M Not something that can be said about many others I'd wager, I add, though I will make sure that whoever was behind Alva pays the same price. There are more of the monsters? His eyes widen, the fear he was attempting to hide coming to the fore. There are indeed, I nod, but you should not concern yourself with them. They will be dealt with soon. How can you be so sure? The man asks disbelievingly. Do you even know who you are speaking to? I deadpan. Instead of answering immediately, he takes another moment to look me over before his eyes widen further and he mutters out an, Oh, oh indeed. I snark and shoo them all away. Now go back to your homes. The issue is outside of both your hands and abilities to face. There is some grumbling among the mob, but they soon start dispersing a couple of them grabbing the unconscious Hrogar with a rather large bump on his head and carrying him to see a healer. Now that that is done, Mephis' voice cuts into my thoughts as the last of the Nords leave. Why don't we pay a visit to the esteemed Jarl and get away from this disgusting bog air? Even if I do not strictly need to breathe, I still like doing it. Serana agrees immediately. I shrug. Might as well inform the steward about what happened. Man could obviously use some sleep. Consensus reached, we left the now trashed house behind us, a part of my mind filled with petty glee at the idea of waking up Idgrod's household in the middle of the night. Much to my disappointment, Idgrod, while recovering, was still very much out of it when we barged into her home. 
her daughter Idgrod the Younger, being a much more sensible creature, immediately offered us lodgings after we finished explaining what happened. It did not take the Jarl's heir and steward much time to realise that their over-reliance on Idgrod's sight and lack of court wizard had come to bite them in the arse, hard. I spent a good hour or so browbeating them into contacting the college before their idiot of a liege awoke and had her misguided pride make the decision for her. A properly attuned mage would have noticed something was amiss with Alva within days at most. We spent a good chunk of the following day just relaxing in the tavern, chatting up the locals and listening to some more useless but entertaining rumours. The noble I'd spoke to earlier, for example, was the leader of the local Stormcloak supporters, but his reputation for cowardice and empty bluster did more damage to his cause than it helped him. Bloody poser. Incompetent political opponents aside, it was at noon that Isran and his dawn guards finally arrived to Morthal. The guards made a bit of a fuss about a bunch of heavily armed men entering their city, but my support had the gates opening within mere moments of their arrival. The first thing Isran did upon arrival was to rush to the slain vampire's home and examine every single bit of evidence he could find. The incredulous look he gave me, one he realised we nearly raised the place to the ground in our attack, kept me chuckling for minutes. Understanding he was wasting his time and seeing how relaxed we were, he finally asked us if we knew something and actually looked a bit miffed that he didn't do that to begin with, forcing his poor men to march out without even letting them have an hour of rest. At least they were enthusiastic. It was always nice to have motivated meat shields after all. General POV. A perpetually balding Breton vampire sat atop a gaudy throne at the head of a large table. A golden cup filled with blood hung securely between his fingers as he pondered some old memory. That was until his guest decided to be difficult again. You will be hunted down, you monster. The bound moth priest yelled out, either spite or despair fueling his words, the righteous warriors of the gods will take your head. They will try. The rich, cultured voice of the vampire hummed in response. I used to be a hunter myself, you know. Swore to hunt down all the vampire clans, in fact, only to realize that the priest who taught me was one himself. It was how I attained my immortality, in fact, the traitorous fool, the first sacrifice on my path to power. Then you should have killed yourself the moment you were infected, the priest retorts hotly, and consign my soul to Cold Harbor. Movarth quirks an eyebrow and scoffs, I think not. Just another excuse for not seeking a cure. The priest presses, but soon finds his jaw unwilling to move. Your boldness will not save you from your fate. Movarth hisses sharply, The only reason I have not taken your mind is the Volkihar's request, do not tempt me further. The only thing Dexian could do as the vampire continued feasting on blood was hope against hope that someone would rescue him and keep trying to glare a hole into the bastard's skull. It might work, right? Clear. A dawn guard armed with an axe and shield calls out as he checks the bolt-ridden corpse that was once the last guard to the lair's entrance. Understood, Isran grunts, his head covered in his order's usual full helmet. Proceed inside, split into two groups, and start taking out as many lesser vampires as you can. Regroup when compromised. His men quickly follow his commands and start shuffling into the cave, a veritable phalanx of crossbows bearing silver-tipped bolts making certain that each and every one of them had someone covering their back. Rather efficient, Raven comments quietly as they follow the advancing vampire hunters. They have to be, Isran says simply, otherwise they risk their lives and their souls. Now enough chit-chat, we have a job to do. He grunts out and pointedly speeds up. He must be very fun at parties. Raven huffs and speeds after the red guard as if he knew what those were in the first place. Mephis sniffs and turns to Serana while pointing at the cave. After you, dear. Unwilling to spend any more time around the supposed Dramora, Serana gets inside without complaint. So quickly, in fact, that she doesn't notice it when Mephis suddenly turns invisible and disappears from all mortal senses, only the slightest movements in the air following her movements deeper into the lair. It would seem that your wish has been granted. Movarth tells the priest with a frown. A pity I had hoped the food would keep their noses out of it. Still unable to speak, 
Dexian settles on producing the closest thing he can to mocking laughter. Laugh freely, little priest. Movarth smiles at him, his fanged mouth promising pain. It might just be your last opportunity. The vampire then shifts to his nearby servants. Call all of my subjects. It seems some sheep have lost their way. Stretching lazily, the old vampire grabs his sword and gets up from his throne. He was relaxed as can be. After all, one would need an army to face his vampires. Movarth's eyes narrowed as his fledgling bowed before him. What do you mean this is all of them? The rest have either not heard it or refused to answer the call. The woman answers blandly, only to earn a smack across the face. They are not refusing the call, you fool. They are dead. Movarth snarls, and you would be too if I did not need every single one of you right now. Before he can finish his motivational speech, he steps back, launching himself much further than his movement would originally suggest. Just in time to dodge a volley of silver bolts slamming into many of his fledglings, taking down a good chunk of his remaining forces in an instant. There is no mercy in his attackers, as more and more bolts descend into the central cavern, slowly but certainly bringing true death to all of his bloodline. Movarth lashes out with his blood magic, striking the likeliest positions of the marksman, but his frustration grows with each spell as someone manages to erect a brilliant golden ward whenever his spells are about to detonate, almost mocking him by dispelling them fully each and every time. As if to add insult to injury, a figure clad in a coat of plates and a full steel helmet and wielding a hammer that radiated a feeling that greatly worried the vampire descended into the chamber, a cloak of sunlight already surrounding it and not even the helm managing to hide the burning hatred within the pair of eyes under it. Wordlessly, the vampire rushes the figure, attempting to stop the barrage of bolts, but finds himself repelled, not with strength of arms, but with positioning, as the hammer-wielding hunter forces him to slow down for a brief moment by catching his blade and directing it aside, which gave the crossbowman enough time to bury a trio of bolts into Movarth's back. With a hiss of pain, Movarth dashes back to the cage beside his throne, pointing his blade at the priest and issuing a threat. Stay back or the priest gets it. What priest? A Dunmer mage peeks out from one of the passages, his voice filled with vicious mockery. Dread descends upon Movarth as he dares look at the now emptied cage, his eyes snapping back to the mage, just in time to see a dress-wearing female Dunmer become visible with the priest held firmly in her dainty hands. His brain finally catches up with what just happened as he realizes he had been standing still for over ten seconds. He is only left with enough time to look down at his bolt-ridden body before he disintegrates and his screaming soul is yanked toward the deeply disturbing fate reserved for his kind. The dawn guards let out a mighty cheer as the master vampire turns to ash, though none forget to reload their crossbows just in case. Even Izran allows himself a smile that no one is able to see. The moth priest begins offering his deep thanks to his rescuers but is soon silenced by the raised hand of the dark elf mage. I am afraid that the celebrations will have to wait, Raven says with annoyance in his voice. It would seem that the departed Movarth was meant to meet with the Volkihar today, and his visitors have just entered my range. Shit. The priest curses and then quickly pretends he said nothing as all eyes fall fall onto him. A beat of awkward silence passes before it is utterly crushed by Izran barking order after order his men scrambling to prepare an ambush and offer a proper welcome to their uninvited guests. That is a lot of noirs, Scorch quips helpfully.